manuscripts. <laughs> so the other real size book of this is in the um, presentation at the moment. But I thought one of you might get a kick out of this. Mm, I wonder which one. Okay. So this is a medieval book of hours, a book of hours. It's a prayer book. Um, in fact, at the beginning, it starts with a calendar. Here is January. Yes, this is all of January. Wow. And what you do with this calendar Every day you check and see what prayers you have to say. So you'll notice that some of the saints are represented in red, like if it's a saint's day, which is the origin of the saints. Red letter day. Hmm. As in, you wake up in the morning and say, what prayers do we say today? And the person responds, it's a red letter day, meaning we have to say prayers to the saints. And so at the bottom of each of these shows a little scene that related to January. So as you go through the calendar, you see these little secular yeah. scenes of what people do during the months. This is a mimic of a much bigger book, but as a result, it's really pretty exquisite because of that. So it has, these are called miniatures, not because they're, these images are called miniatures, not because they're small, but because all these paintings and medieval manuscripts are called miniatures. But these are pretty wow. fabulous. Wow. So if you look real closely, you have to imagine all that's being done with the hair, the single hair, a lot of that work. Okay. Then in addition, you have, see this is, this is from a great period. Look at the background on this. Can imagine someone like some poor starving monk is probably what you know. Actually, this is probably more likely a traveling artist that's doing oh, the that miniature. That's beautiful. Man, I love guilt in miniatures. <laughs> that's good because almost everyone uses it. And there are the actual prayers. Beautiful. And so, much like the 15th century book you've been looking at, what the design of the pattern here the handwriting, also the nature of what these decorations and the columns look like tell us we can figure out where it come, comes from and what century it is. Time period. Yeah, <laughs> everything is kind of regional and cultural. I feel like we've been talking about this in really different art and our different hair styles. It's just unbelievable. Now, I'm not judging, I'm just saying. <laughs> This is Justin J. Rosenwald felt so badly about spending all of his time and money on books that he acquired this, uh, which is a book of hours, a gene of Naples, and had it renamed in his wife's honor. So it's called the Edith Book of Hours. I'm not saying anything really, I'm just telling you the story of this. I'm not necessarily suggesting that would this be a fabulous gift to have. So I give you, for example, but um, it's just, I thought I'd take that out. Thank you. Thank you for that. You're welcome. And in fact, it comes with its own little... Of nice. course it does. Beautiful. That seems to have good gifts. like when it comes, this is an early 17th century book, and just by looking at it, we know a lot about it. We know that this has come directly from the print shop. It's been printed, but it hasn't gone to a binder. This is what a, a printer would do with the book, put it in boards, just whip stitch it in because they know that the buyer is going to have it bound for themselves. So we know See, where book librarians and, and book nerds get excited because that means we're that much closer to the actual printing. No one has, no one has mucked with this. So it's like it just came off the press. And it just so happens this happens to be Galileo's Sidereus Nuncius, which means 
sidereal or starry messenger. And it was printed in 1610. This is the book in which Galileo announces to the world that he's built the telescope and that he's actually observed the moon for the first time with assistance. And that this is what the moon looks like. So for Europe, this is the first accurate image of the moon that they ever saw. And he's kind of surprised because, as he says in the text, it looks like Earth. Yeah. It's not a glassy orb, which they thought it was. Or it's not a, it's not a, a congregation of souls. It's actually a, a planet. And here are some more. So this is a great book because if you get interested in printing, then you can talk about how they didn't plan well for the engravings so that the engravings overprinted on the type. And then in fact, what we have here is a copy that the printer kept because it's flawed. And the flaw is right here. See how there are two circles here? Yep. These are in a press. You put down the plates, you ink them, you clean them off, you put the plates down, you put the piece of paper over it, then you put cotton batten and layers of felt, and then you run it through like squeegees. It forces the paper to go down and pick up the ink, right? But the problem is these were two separate plates, and when it finished the first plate, the second plate went in like to dunk and we got a double impression. So now we know that the printer put this aside because it's a flawed copy. So now we know we have a printer's copy that he kept for various reasons. We also know that Galileo printed this book. So what we think we have Another documentation. is Galileo's copy of the Starry Mist. Little things. It's, it's a little bit cool. of a gee whiz, but wait, it gets better. I have you sat through this book before? Uh, I might have. You have. I did the day before I went to another yes. session. Yes, I saw this in the vaults, didn't I? I think you did. I think sure. Yeah, the first time you did a vault really? tour. <laughs> so, this is why it's important to us, because Galileo wasn't really thinking clearly when he was making this book. Usually when you bind books, you trim it so it's nice and square. Right? After you bind it, you just square it up. And it gets rid of all this variation. Which means there are only two copies in the world that have the entire Milky Way because everyone else loses stars when they find mm. it. So we have one of only two full mm. records of this piece. Even better, he was observing the movement of the moons of Jupiter, which he called the Medicean stars because the Medicis were paying for him. And he's showing you how they are circulating around the moon by either using large or small asterisks, the small ones being behind and the big ones in front. So he's showing you how the moons rotate. Uh, and he was making these observations on a regular basis. And every time he was done typesetting this, he would print it, which makes us think mm. that's Galileo's fingerprints. Pulling the sheet off the press. It's just go ahead, try it. Mm -hmm. So this Touch book is history. important because it changes the whole notion of how the seventeenth century understood the heavens. And the best part of the story is this shows you how important printing is. If we lived in a medieval manuscript period and you were Galileo, you would write out your manuscript and draw on the moon. Right. And then if you wanted a copy, you would copy it, including the drawing. And then you would copy it, and you would copy it. And it would take a lifetime to go from Italy to the Netherlands. In the meantime, the drawings would, would go to crap. And the text would be copied over and over to the point that I'm sure there'd be inconsistencies. Right. And it would take forever. So science just gets slow. And what this book shows is what happens when you print science, because those images are the same on every single page that everybody has. And this travels all across Europe within five years. In five years, it's logged in in Beijing. <laughs> so it goes from wow. Italy to China in five years, in 1610. That's amazing. Done.
you have anything good on there? My son, Aiden, and Eli. So, uh, Ian brought a, a book. I'll show you later. Mark, Mark, and its abundance of riches. Yeah. <laughs> These may be some repeats for you. This was in the news recently, actually. You like that. You like this kind of box within a box within a box. It gives it a false sense of, of value. It's a very small book. Yeah, it's kind of like it's kind of like um, those Russian. Right. Russian right. Yeah. Um, this is the collector's box. This is our. If we get new, if we get new, we take we take this one with us. That's what that box means. That's why it's so drab looking with a number. This is item number one fifty four in the cultural heritage of the American people. Oh and my! We call them books to die for. Yeah. <laughs> we're supposed to run back and get this. Yes, this one in the news recently because of something happening in November with another copy. Yes. Mm. Is there a special place where all the books that you're supposed to go back for are? Yep. So that you can get to? Yep. They're called grab and go books. <laughs> um, um, originally, when they asked for suggestions, I said we should call them books to die for because yeah. when everyone else was running out of the building screaming, yep. you I run in. Them. Um, and they call them something else. Now they call them RIPs, which of course they, they were just shocked when I said they should call them books to die for. But they came up with an acronym, which is RIP. And I said, You guys don't see the. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You were in that. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, anyway, they just. <laughs> so, uh, this is printed in 1640. That's only 30 years after Galileo. But we're all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. We're in Massachusetts Bay. So it's only 10 years after, if we were pilgrims, it's only 10 years after we landed. And so while this character is busy building cabins and plowing fields, the two of you, My ancestors. being more devout, decide that 10 years is enough. We need we need a, a translation of the Psalms into poetry so we can sing them in our service. We used to have one, but the person who did the transcription changed sect and therefore <laughs> could not be used, traded to the cause. So you get twenty five more of your friends together while the other fools are still busy building cabins and plowing fields, and you take the Psalms and you set them to rhyme. And then in the middle of the wilderness, 10 years after landing, you print them. Printing is a very hard thing to do in the wilderness. And you produce this, which is called the Bay Song Book, Massachusetts Bay Book of Songs. Our copy doesn't have a real title page, so somebody transcribed it for us. Mm. We know that our copy was owned by George Livermore. He bought it in Dana Hill in Cambridge. Did you know that? No. Suzanne is a... Direct Livermore. 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 Oh. So you're you're welcome. <laughs> you know, and that's the same Hamlin that Hannibal Hamlin. Right? Yeah. But Hannibal Hamlin is more closely related to me than the Livermores because his mother was a Livermore, who was a first or second cousin of my ancestor. Wow. Isn't that cool? That's actually kind and of phenomenal. Eli knows about my other Livermore, my great 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 grandfather, um, William T. Livermore, who wrote, who kept very extensive Isn't that diaries. Hannibal Hamlin and William were cousins or something. Yeah, like for 
Do they even know? Well, probably, yeah. But Hannibal Hamlin was a much more important person. William was the color guard for the part of Maine at Gettysburg. He carried the flag. <laughs> and he kept these extensive diaries that are sort of very important historically. Mm -hmm. They were very detailed and mm -hmm. very important primary source in many, mm -hmm. many well, Buckaroo, I have a feeling this is completely you then. <laughs> I mean, this is 1640. So if you ever need to see a session, I'm just want to join <laughs> sure. it with somebody. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, of course, you'd be hit with a tax bill. A big tax bill, yeah. I'm not sure you could really carry it, but no. I'm quite certain. <laughs> yeah. So they, they, set the thought songs, nice. they set the songs to cool. poetry. So this is what a book looks like when it's printed. This is the first book printed in what's now the United States. So, the Basin book and the Elliot Bible mm -hmm. are two different things, though. Completely. But I yeah. thought that I had heard the Elliot Bible was the first thing. No, this no. is 1640. Elliot Bible is about 28 years later. Oh, yeah. it's, it's that much later. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the Elliot Bible is the Bible translated into a mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Um, the Indian translation. So, this is, um, used to be, is North America number one, United States number one. You can't, you can't say it's the first American book because they were printing in Mexico for about 120 years before this. <laughs> so, um, so, so this recently showed up in the news because there's a church in Boston that has two copies. Even though this was printed in a huge edition, there are only about nine, nine copies extant. And a church in Boston owns two of them, and they decided to sell one. The Old North Church, right? Yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. And ours came from First South, actually. Ours came oh, from really? First South, the, cha the um, steeple of First South Church. <laughs> wow. And then was picked up by Bible owners, the Bible collectors. And then in 1930, the Library of Congress published a book entitled um, 100 Books Most Desired by the Library of Congress. Cl clever of you. And um, the book number one was the Beethoven book, and Ms. Van Sindren yep. said, I think Uncle has that, and convinced him to donate it. And at the time, it was the last copy of the writing. Wow. So we were very lucky to have this. So um, the church in Boston's putting it up for auction. Do you know how much they're going to ask for it? What they think they're going to ask for it? Want to guess? The first book printed in the United States. Dad was actually talking about this a couple days ago. <laughs> that might be more. Here, I can tell that. Um, between fifteen and thirty million dollars. Yeah. So Ian's decided, for example, that many of you are really going to Scotland, <laughs> and he and I are going in. We're part going in. Part right. We're going to be the underbidders. <laughs> Behind one or two people, I yeah. can think of off the top of my yeah. head. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I suppose we should show this since we've got the guys here. It's pretty cool. <laughs> this one, we're going backwards in time a little bit, but I think you might like this. So, this is a 15th century book. Right at the end of the 15th century. It's actually a blank book. It was a blank book. And it turns out to be a bit of a diary. <laughs> And it starts off saying, this is the, it's a book of letters or the book of my observations, really. Um, and my name is Angelo Trevisio. And I am a counselor to the seas. I am the blah, 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 as appointed by her, her majesty, the Queen of Spain. And then he goes on to talk about how he's uh, starting this because he has been given the important position of serving as engineer for the Admiral of the Seas, who is Cristoforo Columbus. Christopher Columbus. He runs into America. <laughs> he does run into America, kind of. Does. Not really, he runs into Cuba. <laughs> of this handwritten first person document might be important. <laughs> this is the only surviving account of the voyage of Columbus. Do you think it's good that he writes a little bit more legibly than we do? Well, but that's the punchline. How many different languages? There's is this? Portuguese. In this, it's Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, Latin. Yeah. 
That's amazing. Yeah. So, and if I remember, he's a navigator and not a commentator, so it's a little dull. But this is why we know <laughs> that Columbus is tall with red hair, for example. He's described. <laughs> so this this came and went on the voyage. You know, on the on the boats that came. The last this is sort of we like you people. guys when you travel and your grandmother always encourages you to keep a you keep nice, tight journals like this, the last right? Time we were here. You said that no one's fully translated. Right. It. No one has. It's still. No, I can't seem to find anything. I just I find yeah. that baffling. Yeah. And I, I it amazes me I mean, that there isn't a grad student out there who. I mean, there are dissertations on the intergenerational <coughs> correlation of internet generational dog ownership statistics and and yet no one's done this i don't know yeah. <coughs> okay so i'm going to jump around a little is that okay yeah because we're rapidly moving into cool things <laughs> have you seen kipling before uh actually we have we i don't think new... they did you haven't seen kipling all right so bear with me yeah definitely right? not new. you no, haven't seen kipling okay you know who he is Kipling is, a, is a, a writer. He wrote the Jungle Book. We have a new miniature. Right, we do. Yep. So, um, this is actually the story of a man who's in the French Foreign Legion. His name is Maurice Hominum. And during World War I, the Legion is involved in a battle. And Hominum is the only man of his division uh, who survives the attack. So, um, he's the only man that survives. Everyone else is killed. And the reason he survives, because he was shot, was that he was carrying in his cape a, co a French translation of Kipling's Kim. So there's the bullet hole. And you can see it doesn't go through. And in fact, you can see that it. Wow. So he had this in his pocket like this, and it saved his life. Sort of the antithesis of books to die for. Exactly. So he was so struck by this, um, and he was much um, honored for being the only survivor. And in fact, he was given this, which is called the Croix de Guerre, which is a very famous medal from France. <laughs> Cross of War. Mm -hmm. So the Croix de Guerre. Um, and he was so taken Beautiful by the fact that his there. book saved his life. This is a great binding. Yeah. Uh, he, was, he was so taken by the fact that the book saved his life that when he read that Kipling's son was killed in the war, his son John, uh, he decided to send him the medal and the book and wrote him a letter and said, you know, you're right, your book saved my life and I understand you lost your son. And so in memory of him and in commemorating the event, I'd like you to have this. And they start up a course. Yes, yeah, so, so they start up a correspondence back and forth. This is Kipling and Hamino writing back. And Kipling said he'll accept it, but only but but if Hamino ever has a son, he will he return wants him to go back. So uh, Kipling keeps it for a while, and then Hamino, in fact, does have a son, who he named John. John, and in honor of John Kipling, he names his son John Hamino. Mm. So Kipling puts this all together and sends it back with a letter that's attached at the end. And the letter is to the young John. It's like the coolest thing written by it. I think this is actually the letter here. Uh, my dear little Jean, when you're old enough to listen instead of being listened to, your papa will tell you of a very ancient war in which he took part and how he was saved from being killed by a bullet which was turned away from his heart by hitting against a book of mine, for I am the writer of books, which he carried in his coat, in his cape, or his, his coat. He goes on to talk about the gift of the Croix de Guerre and all that. Um, and I also promised your papa that when you came, I would write you a good advice on the sort of books that's best to take into battle. Listen. 
Such books should not be less than 350 pages. <laughs> and if possible, 400. The width of them should be from 10 to 12 seven centimeters and the length between 18 and 20. They should not be bound in stiff covers because though a stiff cover presents more resistance to a projectile than a limp one, a bound book is less easily sucked into the pocket of your military cape. And it is of first importance that the book should always be in the pocket, the left hand <laughs> breast pocket. <laughs> Isn't that yeah, pretty wow. fabulous? I'm so I, that That's awesome. Seen this? Ah, not, yeah. not this. No. This is the oh, origin I mean, of I've, the word gerrymandering. I mean, I've seen images. Gerrymandering in human geography this year. Wow. So, do you know what gerrymander is? Gerrymander is when they, uh, when politicians who are in control, redesign the districts yeah. in your community to determine how you vote. So. They will divide the population up into districts to favor either Republicans or Democrats. And they've been trying to do that in Maine to, uh, because they need to change because the balance of population has shifted a little. And they've been fighting about that because some people new don't species like our, of monster. our representative, Shelley Kingery, who lives up near you, right? And some of them have been trying to change it so that she would be elected. By changing the district so that a different population is there. So this one is an extreme. Now, it's not. It's named after the guy that just happened to be governor. He really didn't right. have anything to do with it, right. Governor Jerry, but he, he's the one that gets stuck with the name of it. But this is the original gerrymander cartoon, where this is where the term comes from, the gerrymander. So do you see what they did? They like made the district go all the way out there instead of nice straight lines or... They have the woodcut. Do you really? There's no woodcut for this. Which one? Wow. Wow. DC is Massachusetts. Averill, McGowan, Andover, Cambridge, Essex. Yeah. No. no. Districts. Districts in Massachusetts. in Massachusetts. Voting districts, like counties. So, like for a particular representative, would be voted on in that. Area. So. They're just, well, that's, that's just excellent. The cartoon, saying it's it's so hideously cut up that it's like a monster. Right. They've created a monster. So they sort of mm -hmm. added, he added bills and like teeth and tongue. Actually, there are right. people that think that P-Town really is a forked tongue of the Oh, world. really? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to find things you have. Have you seen the original Bill of Rights? No, I don't think so. Oh, thank goodness. So, how many amendments in the Bill of Rights? Do you remember? Is it a trick question? It's, it is a trick question, but there's a correct answer. He's trying to figure yeah. out how much we all know. How many? How many? How many? How many? How many? Ten. Oh, that's four ten. Twelve. Ten. It's twelve. That isn't what I thought. I thought it was twelve. But they changed. But so, they changed it, right? During the debate of the Constitution, mm. states, Rhode Island being one of them, start saying, "We're not going to pass this unless you guarantee us certain rights." Madison says, "Well, fine." Alexander Hamilton says, "No, no, no, no. You start enumerating rights, and those will be the only rights you have. That is, if you make a list of the rights that you're right. guaranteed, you're not guaranteed anything else." Right. Leave it alone. And Madison capitulates and says, okay, 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 I'll write some, I'll write out a list of rights because they want to be treated as an amendment to the Constitution of the Union, and they're not going to pass the Constitution unless these are attached. So the first ten amendments to the Constitution happened with the passage. And they're the ones we argue about a lot, right? Like the right to hold arms. To bear arms. Um, although so I'll demonstrate. 
That's a very bare arm. The Constitution gives me the right to. Don't people always argue that that amendment was for a militia? Not yes. Well, they don't argue. It's in the plain text. The text actually says Both. Yeah. that we shall never be subject. You know, the text implies that we will never be subject to a standing army from another country again, right. and that we have the right to form a militia, a citizens' militia. And from that, various People segments have interpreted it means that we can have 40 art rifles in our garage. <laughs> And apparently carry them and shoot people. <laughs> because, you know, freedom. After we harass them, we feel threatened by yes. us. That's right. So we'll shoot them. Yes. Oh, yeah. So Madison writes up a Bill of Rights with 12 amendments. And some of them, this is it. This is what he had published. Some of them are pretty familiar, like a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, how right. gun control, how gun yeah. advocates can construe that any other way, I don't know. Um, no soldier should at any time war be quartered in your house. This is all about not living with the English. Um, <laughs> ex um, excessive bail should not be required, nor excessive fines imposed. Right. But there are 12 of them, and only 10 of them went to vote. And that's because as people were reading them, they said, you know, Mr. Madison, if you're going to start writing the rights of the people, maybe right number one and right number two shouldn't involve how Congress gets paid. <laughs> ah. <laughs> wow. I showed this to Nancy Pelosi and was telling the story. She read the first word. She says, oh my god, nothing's changed. <laughs> One of them goes on to become like the 17th wow. Amendment to the Constitution, right. which is which says members of Article Congress can't pass their own pay raise. They can only raise the pay of the next house, not their own. So in other words, to keep your group honest, they can't give themselves raises. They can only give future members of the house raises. Huh. So there was enough disagreement over this that Madison dropped number one and two and it became the 10th Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> this is the original Bill of Rights. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it is pretty awesome. And actually, it's a very rare document. Apparently. Huh. Just because I suppose it makes sense in a way. Our challenge is that we just want to make sure that it says I support the right to arm bearers. <laughs> yes, I feel that way too. I don't think so. No. He's a replica? I think here. Yep. Here's the story. They form a Congress in 1776 because the English have actually invaded already and they're a little upset about people marching through Massachusetts. <laughs> and so they get together to talk about what they're going to do. And every colony sends a couple of representatives. John Adams is pushing for independence in the South, is saying, no, oh, maybe not. We should just behave ourselves. And Adams is getting more and more concerned that they're not going to vote in his, in his favor. So just as they're getting close to a vote, Adams comes up with this great idea. Why don't we have something written up so we know what we're referring to? And he does that just to delay things so he can lobby people. In the meantime, New Jersey sends two new people, completely flips the vote. And by the time uh, this, this document is ready to go, they're, they hold the vote and they're quite surprised. The committee gets together. It's Ben Franklin, uh, John Adams, Thomas Mitchell. Jefferson, Livermore, not Livermore. Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to lose the names now because I said that. Yeah. Livingston and um, the guy I always forget. And the fifth guy. And they all sit down and they all turn to Thomas Jefferson and say, Tom, why don't you write this up? Yeah. So Thomas Jefferson has uh, writes a rough draft of what we call the Declaration of Independence, which we have here. It's an amazing document. And then on the night of July 4th, the evening of July 4th, 
we go across the street to a print shop, John Dunlap's print shop, and he prints up the Declaration of Independence. So the thing that you think of with all the signatures happens much, much later. Right. That's called the engrossed copy, and that has to do with John Adam, uh, with John Hancock looking at this piece of paper and saying, "No, he says, is mine the only treason?" Oh, right. Of it's mine the only treason. This is right. the only name on this document. You're because, all coming back. Because if they got caught, if the king found this, they, you know, they could have been hung. Yeah, he would be arrested treason. for treason, but he's the only one signing it. Right. On print, so they print this up. So this is the Declaration of Independence. This is the document that says there's a certain moment in time in history when humans who have made a contract with their ruler have the ability to say enough is enough. It comes based on a train of abuses that we have suffered. Here's everything that the king has done to us, and we have suffered under a tyrant, and therefore, as freestanding men and women, or let me say women, but freestanding men. Um, who have um, the right to social contract, we declare ourselves free and independent of this tyranny. In other words, they're saying to the king. <laughs> and they print these up at John Dunlap's print shop in Philadelphia on July 4th, 1776. And they hand them out. John Hancock takes one look at it and says, Mine's the only treason. Not really. Well, you're well, right. John Dunlap printed yes. it. You're right. But but it makes a better story. It's sort of more like messenger. Yeah, just right. Paid to print. He just got paid. Although he's printing treason. Yeah. Um, so every member of the committee gets one, and they all get on horseback right away and uh, ride to their constituents, and they stop at courthouses, and it's read aloud, and someone copies it, and they get back on the horse. And this is how the colonies learn that we've declared war on England. Washington is standing outside the convention. Because he, although he's not a member of it, he's waiting to get the troops paid. He wants them to vote money for the troops. And they're not doing that. And instead they give him this document which says, could you inform the troops that, well, we've just declared war on the greatest power in the history of the world. Uh, which he does, and causes them to riot in New York, and they tear down the statue of George III. And most importantly, one copy of this goes to George III in England gets put on a boat, and sent and this over. is what he reads. This is how he learns that American colonies have declared independence. And that copy still exists. It's in the British Library, which is so cool. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the Declaration of Independence. So whose copy is this? I think this one is Peter Forces. We have George Washington's and Peter Forces. Washington's is trying wow. This is also very, very scarce. Yeah. And the last time this came up from market, I think it sold for like eight million. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a while ago, like ten yeah. years. Normally there hasn't been one. Yeah. yeah. There hasn't been one in years. You know, to our amusement was traveling around America in these like bulletproof stanchion glass case, you know, like no one could get near it. Yep. And, you know, those of us who have copies were still looking at it, thinking, I remember standing there with three people, all of whom were at institutions that owned one, and I said, do you guys have any? <laughs> and I said, we just bring ours out. If you have, we just bring ours out. <laughs> guards and glass. And so. I have a question about the books that you have to say. There was a crisis where you'd have to save the books. Would you be putting them under arms, or would you have them out on? There's a truck that's designed for this. There's also people with lists, <laughs> and um, you know it's a flawed idea at best, but uh, probably serves a function of a certain sort. Makes it work. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it, it's based on a, a thing that we did during World War II when all the valuable materials in the Library of Congress were removed. Did you know that? I didn't know that. They were all sent away to various institutions, and rare books were sent to Fort Knox. Really? And other books were sent to UCLA. They were sent to outlying universities. 
That makes so that sense. Yeah. So, um, I basically remember from the tour that we went on that EVA has a process like the back of the library of Congress yes. or something. Yeah, well, yeah, it's kind of, yeah. I'm not quite sure what that would mean now if we go back yeah. there and have more. Yeah. So we'll look at that in a minute. Famous newspaper printing comes from Vicksburg, Mississippi. Do you think? I think I have. Okay. It comes from Vicksburg, Mississippi. It was supposed to be printed on July 2nd, 1863. And this is a town in Mississippi. Uh, Grant and his troops have surrounded Vicksburg. Okay. And the city itself is really hanging tight. And they're actually kind of printing incendiary kinds of reports in town, kind of like taunting General Grant and saying he will never die in Vicksburg. He will never come into Vicksburg. We will fight him off to the men. And this was set into type on July 2nd. Well, of course, Grant was just pushing that, the, just waiting for them to cave. And on the night of July 2nd, the town evacuates. And uh, by July 4th, General Grant and the Union Army have taken over Vicksburg. But unlike other places where they would just decimate the town, the soldiers sort of took over the city, and a group of them walked into the newspaper office of the Daily City. Well, this is not quite not in the Went into the newspaper office of the Daily Citizen where they found the July 2nd issue in the type, in the press, ready to go. Yeah. And Swords, who was the editor, was very kind of flagrantly yeah. attacking. Grant, and they all kind of knew this. So instead of ransacking the newspaper office, they printed the newspaper. And the only thing they changed was this little paragraph down here. Otherwise, they printed the newspaper as it was sent. And this is what they say. It said, two days bring about great changes. This was set in July 2nd. This is dated July 4th. Note, <laughs> July 4th. Two days bring about great changes. The banner of the Union floats over Vicksburg. General Grant has caught the rabbit. He has <laughs> dined in Vicksburg, and he did bring his dinner with him. The citizen lives to see it, um, lives to see it for the last time it appears on wallpaper. Oh. Wow. Can you think about why they would be printing newspapers on wallpaper in the South? Because they didn't have... The blockade, the blockade, the blockade wow. prevented them from getting newsprint. So they're printing their publications on anything they can get their hands on. So this is known as the newspaper edition of Vicksburg, Mississippi. Wow. So they print it and it says, this is the last time that this will appear on news on paper. No more will it eulogize the luxury of mule meat and fricasseed kittens. <laughs> Urge Southern warriors to a diet forevermore. This is the last wallpaper edition and is, accepting this note from the types as we found them, it will be valuable hereafter only as a curiosity. Wow. Isn't that cool? It's amazing. Not only do we have one, but we have two, and they're different wallpapers. Nice. Oh. Oh, 
I know exactly what this is. This is for Booth, Harold, and Mark. Wow. So this is they produced four different wanted posters right after the assassins were. Oh, look at the robot. You get them all. That's a hundred thousand, which is about somewhere between one and a half to two and a half million dollars. Wow. So this is very famous for a book book reason also. Right. This is the first time that albumin photographs were reproduced to be used consistently on a poster. Yeah. Or anywhere actually. Um, so you didn't have albumin photographs in books yet. So this was a very big deal. And this is really, really scarce because you almost never find it with all of them. And you almost never find it with Booth in any kind. If Booth is there, he's been defaced. Usually he's cut out. You can quite wow. a little piece. It's amazing. In addition, well, that that in the end, there's in the aggregate, it's nearly two hundred thousand. Yeah, it's real money. 